I am pleased to welcome Louis Barnett, the young entrepreneur and the chocolate winner of the Emerging Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011. Louis received the Lord Charter Award for Excellence in Food Industry presented to him at the House of Lords in 2009, and he was 17. Please welcome Louis Barnett. Brilliant. Okay. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about my story, how I began uh, in the chocolate business and now through to a, a very interesting project which I'm starting in Mexico uh, in line with an entirely new start. So my story began at the age of 11. I was quite a miserable school student, always had a lot of issues at school, got bullied all the way through my school life and it got up to my year six SATs. And uh, I basically got told that unless I could improve my handwriting, I wouldn't be allowed to take the exam at all. Uh, I met, met a local teacher in the village. I, I live in the West Mids, if you can't tell by my accent. And uh, uh, the, the teacher I was working with as sort of uh, extra home education uh, was a specialist in learning disabilities. Within a couple of uh, sort of t uh, sessions with her, she said, well, I think you've got dyslexia. Uh, I thought that meant I didn't have to go to school at all. It wasn't quite the case. Shame. Uh, so I, I went back to school for a while. A lot of promises were made uh, by obviously the local council. Uh, none of them were really kept. I sort of just about scraped through my SATs. Ended up sort of six weeks in secondary school. Uh, bullying escalated and, and various other things. And uh, I ended up being taken out of home education. Uh, and, you know, it's a funny thing when doing that because obviously, you know, your entire life in school is planned out. Everything you do every single day, you've got the timetable, you know what you're going to do. And then suddenly everything ends and you've got to figure out what you want to do. And the only two things I'd really ever been passionate about was animals and food. So after a good couple of months of sort of just sitting around annoying my parents, uh, I eventually started work at a falconry centre, so working in British uh, conservation with birds of prey, owls and eagles and that sort of thing. Uh, but at the same time, I was cooking with sort of friends and family. That escalated. My auntie asked me to make her a cake for her 50th birthday, then loads of other family and friends, and so it started to snowball. Uh, and I ended up with about sort of 40 or 50 local people that were buying cakes and some truffles and chocolates off me. And then in uh, s December of 2000 and yeah, December 2005, I walked into my local Waitrose store, and at the time, you know, kind of local food was becoming trendy, it was, it was the in thing, and I walked up to the store manager and said, well, you know, I'm a local guy, I make chocolate, do you want some? And he explained it wasn't quite that simple, uh, so he gave me a business card, I sent some products down to the post room at Waitrose, uh, about four days later, I was sitting in front of the head buyer, and uh, I'll never forget the moment when my parents walked out the room and the buyer looks at me and he's like, are they going to the car for something? I said, no, it's, it's my business. So I became uh, Waitrose Youngest Ever Supplier at the age of 13. Uh, I, I had a, an order for 165 chocolate boxes, which to me was massive. I'd been making like three or four. Uh, so uh, I had to move into out my kitchen, uh, into the garage. Mom is a, a an, well, was at the time an artist and muralist, so she had quite flexible working hours. My dad handily worked in health and safety in that uh, factory, so we sort of food graded, moved the car out, and I gave the floor a bit of a scrub, painted a few bits, uh, got it all food graded, and we started producing. Uh, so I just about got the waitress order done. Um, and then a couple of months after that, we'd had some sort of industry press and things. I got invited down to London for a massive food show, got a little bit of cash together, went down there. We got a one meter square stand. So it was literally, you know, we, both my dad and I couldn't fit in the space, the stand that we had, a little table, two shelves, and, and that was it. And uh, on the second day, we had this sort of woman walking around with a, with a clipboard. She just pointed to me. She goes, you're, the, you're that chocolate kid, aren't you? One who supplies Waitrose or something. I said, yeah, that, that's me. And she said, well, we've got the head board of Sainsbury's upstairs. Do you want to come and do a presentation? Okay. Uh, so I went up, did my presentation, sort of Dragon's Den style, sent me out, brought me back in. And they said, uh, Louis, you've just become our youngest ever supplier at the age of 14. Uh, and you've received one of the highest recorded schools at Sainsbury's uh, for a presentation. Now, I had no flip chart, no laptop, no uh, business, well, business cards that you want to call them, you know, printed off the home printer, that sort of thing. Uh, packaging was pretty basic. And all I had was my passion. And I think at the point in my life, I'd realized that I had nothing else. This was my now only option. 
Uh, I had no qualifications. I had nothing apart from the business. So I put all of my focus and attention on it, um, slightly illegally. Uh, <coughs> we, you know, we won't talk about that. But I did. I did uh, prove that I was, uh, you know, gaining education through business and, and what I was doing. So I, I went on, uh, and a lot of sort of press and PR, and there was this kind of real bubble went up. I uh, started training in chocolate uh, at the uh, Calabat Academy, paid for a couple of courses, then got sponsored. Uh, minimum age was 16, I was still 14 at the time. They didn't kick me out. So I, I then would go down, you know, so many times a month to study in chocolate, all the way from sort of basic chocolate confectionery up to molecular level food studies. Um, so I, I became Sainsbury's then, youngest ever supplier at 15. Things were going really well. I'd, I'd got my own factory at this point, and the... Basically, in 2007, we delivered 165 chocolate boxes. By December of 2007, I delivered 100,000. So we had a pretty, pretty steep growth trend. Uh, and uh, well obviously, we were producing everything by hand. It was all very high-quality materials and ingredients. Uh, as I said, we had an awful lot of press, exposure, media. Uh, the BBC, uh, BBC Breakfast Live came to feature at the factory, and, and then that was it. My sort of life changed forever. I'd got a new foreign news crew turning up weekly, Japanese, Russian, Indian, all, all, all sorts of different news channels. Uh, so I was, I was on cloud nine, you could say. And then when I was about 16... Uh, I, I got a lot of sort of business mentors and people around me, and I and they were sort of saying, well, you know, you need to you need to take this further. You need to take it to the next step. So I thought, well, I, I probably need one of those investor things. I've heard about those. Probably would. I, I need some more money to expand. So I met a load of people. Uh, met uh, a guy at a conference who, um, very wealthy chap, went down to his uh, ex footballer's mansion that he'd bought in Hertfordshire. Stayed in the guest wing of the house. Like eight cars on the drive, all, all the stuff that you would expect. And, uh, and him and his team did a very good job of reeling us in. Long story short, uh, they were money laundering through different companies, and my company included. And uh, within the space of a couple of weeks, I got taken for 100 grand. So, you know, you, to go from Cloud9 to, you know, 100 grand in the red was quite an interesting experience at the age of 16. And I had to really, you know, sort of look at what I was doing and look at the business and redevelop and, uh, you know, just about managed to save the business from, from bankruptcy. And uh, we pulled through over the other side. I ended up with heart condition uh, because of the stress, actually. Um, and we sort of pulled through and then I started exporting. Unfortunately, at that time, we're talking about sort of 2008, early 2009 period. So not only had we had this big blow, but the UK economy was sort of crashing out on us. So I had to look for another solution, which was export. I uh, started exporting little bits to sort of Europe here and there, but nothing, nothing really had any traction. And it was only then when I was invited over to Mexico for a food show uh, in 2010 and, and US end of 2009 and a few other things that suddenly we had all these big orders coming in. We're talking about, I'll give you a comparison. I would spend an hour and a half with a customer down the road and they'd place an order for you know a couple of cases worth of product retail value of about you know, 100 quid. I spent 15 minutes with a buyer in, uh, in New York and they bought three pallets worth of stock. That's 5,500 bars on each pallet, uh, each one being you know, sort of about 15 grand's worth of value. So I suddenly realized that, uh, you know, get rid of my islander mentality. It's not just Britain. And I need to look at the world. I need to think about a global business because, you know, this is the trend. We have technology at our disposal every single day, but a lot of businesses aren't utilizing that. We can communicate from one side of the planet instantaneously. So that, that carried on. And I've had this real sort of split, uh, you know, parts in my business where there's this sort of chocolate element and everything I was doing within the chocolate confectionery industry. Um, uh, by the age of 19, I was named as a World Chocolate Ambassador, sort of like a Michelin star, but specifically for that industry. Uh, and I talked a lot about that. I, I talk a lot about age, the fact that you know, age is not, a, is not a barrier, it's a number. And I never saw it as being an issue, and therefore I just powered on through and, and sort of made my mark in the industry. But I, I had this parallel side, which was both the educational uh, sides, the you know, enterprise and entrepreneurialism, but also the, um, I hate to use the word, you know, learning disabilities as, as it was known back then. So, I mean, I've been working with the British Dyslexia Association, Dyslexia Action, and many other organisations since, since I was about 13 years old and, you know, speaking at conferences. And, you know, for me, right from the very start, 
when I got diagnosed, you know, when I was 11 years old, I was worried for about a day until my mom showed me a video of Sir Richard Branson talking about his dyslexia. And from that point onwards, I saw it as an advantage, not a disadvantage. And that's always the way it's played a part in my life. I see things in a very abstract manner, as, as many of us do, and I'm, I'm so glad that more people are using the term neurologically diverse and getting away from this whole disability thing, because it's, it's ridiculous. I understand for government funding, we need that title there, but for any other reason, it's certainly not a disability, and, and not from uh, all of the fantastic people that I've seen, and I've met you know, many, many multi-multi-billionaires who are all so, uh, neurologically diverse. In, in fact, there was a meeting when I was over in Singapore with the 150 wealthiest people in the whole of China, and only one of them had ever gone to university. Uh, all of them uh, were neurologically diverse in, in some way. So, you know, there you go. It's, it's always been an ability rather than a disability. So I've always followed this, this parallel, and I've had a very interesting, you know, business uh, experience through, through my many years. It's, it was 11 years this September just gone that I've been in business. I'm, I'm 24 now, so I, I feel a bit old at the game. And, um, and so, you know, my, my future uh, actually is turning a, a rather different path. I'm coming out of the uh, chocolate and confectionery industry in, in the traditional sense, and uh, I'm moving more into sustainable agriculture and sort of health and wellness because there's been this quite monumental change, certainly within uh, me as a person. I don't want to touch, I'm not going to bore you with, with the detail, but something that really helped me um, adapt and, and change and, and uh, I don't want to say cope because that's not quite the case, but, but allow my uh, advantage uh, to become more advantageous was health and nutrition. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've spent the last sort of two and a half years uh, studying biology and nutrition, but now uh, going into quantum biology, so looking at quantum mechanics within the human body and, and understanding uh, things at that level. Um, we're actually seeing huge research. I've got a lot of friends uh, around the world who are uh, top professors and researchers who are looking into uh, neural, neuro conditions uh, and neuro, even, you know, we're talking about severe uh, brain hemorrhaging and injuries, and they're repairing massive amounts of damage through diet change. And by understanding, I think, uh, an important part of the next 10 years in neurologically diverse conditions is understanding the body's health and wellness and its impact. Um, and since me changing my diet about sort of three years ago, I've you know, noticed a massive, massive change. Um, any sort of depression and anxiety and various things that I went through completely gone away. I've reversed my heart condition. I was heading towards diabetes. That's now completely gone. So there's, a, there's a many, many things that actually I think, you know, out in the industry now, in, in the sort of forefronts of science, we're starting to realize that, you know, diet plays such a massive part. And, and quite simply, the easiest way I could explain to you is that the brain, 70% of all brain function runs on cholesterol. So you know this whole big myth about cholesterol being a bad thing. If I pulled all the cholesterol out of you, you'd have about half a second to live before you died. Your brain would shut down. So don't read everything, don't believe everything you read in the papers. Cholesterol is a good thing when it's in balance with other systems in the body and, and understanding how your brain uh, heals itself and, and readapts. I've got a, a number of friends who are researchers in, in the States, in the UK, who are now repairing 20 and 30 percent brain damage from serious brain injuries and over the space of six months they're partially now re uh, uh, completely reducing symptoms of Alzheimer's and dementia. Is it, I'm not sure whether any of you know, Alzheimer's now in medical at the top uh, end of the medical spectrum is actually type 3 diabetes. So Alzheimer's is an entirely lifestyle and nutritional based uh, Neolithic disease. It has nothing to do with hereditary and it has nothing to do with anything else. It's entirely down to your body's uh, function and repair mechanisms. So. I think, you know, I, I very much turned the corner and I would at least like to, to stress to you, if, if nothing else, maybe just to think about this, even, even in a very small way, to think about the fact that, you know, your diet has such a massive impact on your cognitive ability, on the people around you and your ability to actually heal your own brain. 
uh, you know, if, if they can do it with dementia, Alzheimer's and other serious brain injury conditions, surely you can improve uh, any of your cognition, uh, any of you sitting here today. So, as I said, I, I've had this really interesting uh, business uh, experience over, you know, many, many years. And I would just say to you simply today that, you know, for me, we need to all band together and we need to talk more about these neurologically diverse conditions. And I'm seeing more corporates starting to recognize that diversity by embracing neurologically diverse conditions is it very advantageous in the workplace. It's very advantageous within teams. Uh, and this is something that you know we all have to support each other with. Um, now I'm disappearing off to Mexico to ha to um, live out my hippie dreams by buying a large plot of land, and we're building eco-sustainable housing, uh, an organic uh, farm, and uh, we're going to be building sustainable eco-tourism over there. And one of the projects that I'm running in in Mexico is going to be around neurologically diverse conditions and creativity within things like um, ag agriculture, architecture, because I think this is. You know, of all the people that I find within neurologically diverse conditions, they have this fantastic ability simply to look outside the box. And that's all I did. You know, all the way through my career, I looked at things a slightly different way. Whether it was chocolate, whether it was the molecular side of things, I have a real sort of aptitude for detail. Uh, the fact I couldn't put pen to paper and anybody but even myself struggle reading it didn't make any difference. And, uh, you know, I, I found my own aptitudes through detail. So... I would say that we all need to talk more about the creative side. We all need to start talking more about neurologically diverse and the fact that actually all the research that's been done by guys like Dr. Peter Congdon and, and the real experts out there is suggesting that actually dyslexia doesn't exist on its own. Dyspraxia doesn't exist on its own. It's a, it's a grouping of a few symptoms that we as humans sort of put a label on. But actually neurologically diverse does exist and it is proven that it exists. But actually, if you've got you know, dyslexia or dyspraxia, or whatever label you want to put on it, the chances are at 90-something percent likely that you'll also have many, many other things that could be labelled. So think about nutrition. Think about the creativity uh, within we do. And I think you know, going forward, we just need to talk about this as aspect of creativity and where neurologically diverse conditions can offer um, real advantages for corporates, real advantages for our local councils, for politics, for many, many things, because they need us to look outside of the box. Uh, and they say that on any species, if you look at animals, insects, uh, you know, whatever you're looking at on planet Earth, there's around about 15% of any uh, species of animal uh, or mammal, reptile, insect, that are known as the sort of mavericks, the ones who don't quite do things the way that the others do, the ones who uh, explore their territory more, the ones who do and change behavioral patterns. And we are some of the mavericks. You know, we're the ones who need to challenge the status quo. We're the ones who need to challenge the way that things have been done. And I think with embracing technology and embracing things into the future, that's the way that we can do it. We can harness all of our creative power. So. You guys, you know, I think don't realise sometimes how, poor, how important these groups are and how life-changing they are and going to be many times in the future for people. And, you know, people like me showing that it's not been a barrier at all. You can see that it's not been a barrier. It's been an advantage, and, and that's the way we need to see it. We need to champion uh, neurologically diverse conditions. So thank you so much. I'm not sure whether we have time for questions, but obviously I'm going to be hanging around, so I'd be more than happy to chat to you. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that social stuff, as I'm sure all of you should be or must be. Uh, and please do get in touch. Thank you very much.